The gospel is a joyful announcement. The word gospel comes from an old English word which means good story or good message. In Latin we have the bona ad non bona ad nuntiatio. Yeah. That means good announcement. In Greek we have the euangelion. And that's a compound word where u means good and angelion means message. So there's also the Greek word angelos, which means messenger. So an euangelion is not just the good message, but the good messenger. And so the point being made there is that when you have a joyful announcement, you should also have a joyful announcer. Because they go together. That the joy that you carry within yourself is what you're sharing with others. And if what you are proclaiming as the gospel is not a joyful announcement, if it's lacking in joyfulness or lacking in being an announcement of an event that has happened, then it's not the gospel. And what you are proclaiming is not actually the gospel. So another term we have for the gospel is glad tidings, and I want to dig deeper into the term glad tidings. Glad means shining or joyous. The root that it comes from has associations as meaning bright, smooth, shining, and is the same root as words such as glass, glaze, gold, glisten, gleam, gloss, glee, glory, and glide. These terms you can see have to do with something being smooth, something being shiny, something being reflective, something being bright, something being of a glow, another word that is from the same root. Having a glow. So glad is shining and joyous. It is it is something that should be bright and smooth. Not rough, not dull. And so to be glad is to radiate with joy, exuberance, enthusiasm, delight, bliss. The term jolly is another word that's related to joy. And it indicates being merry, festive, pleasant, overflowing with excited enthusiasm. So this is what it means to be glad. To be glad is to be overflowing with excited enthusiasm. The word tidings comes from a root tadan mean, meaning to happen or an occurrence. So glad tidings is a joyous something that happened or an occurrence. So that's where we get the idea of the announcement of an event. So it's a joyous announcement of an event. Well, an event is something that happened, an occurrence, as the root of tidings indicates. The root that the word tidings comes from also is the root of the word tide, which is a division of time. And so we indicate the coming, the rising and falling of the tide as being a division of time. And so that we, we even indicate as a certain time, it is high tide. We're indicating a time, not just an elevation of the water level. But so what we're talking about is an announcement of an event and a division of time. So glad tidings would be to be overflowing with excited enthusiasm for announcing an event that happened and divided time. And so, what we're talking about is the new creation. And so, what the gospel is announcing is new creation. And it's not announcing pending, looming in the future, off in the distance, or maybe you can get to it when you die, new creation. It's announcing joyfully an event that has happened and that already has divided time. 
and is the new creation. And so there's a number of objections to this idea that the new creation has already happened. And I can understand that because I struggled with it myself. Going back, I was an atheist and more aptly, I was a nihilist who just saw everything as getting progressively worse over time and slowly deteriorating. And that ultimately every year was worse than the previous one. And I was getting older and tighter and achier and more bitter. And yet becoming less and less capable of efficiently using my time. And that was my perception. And also, even from growing up, I just had this concept, this self-image where it was just fundamentally wrong to be me. I lived an entire lifetime of being utterly dissatisfied with who I was. And in constant attempt to change who I was, but it was always an upstream battle. And it was tiring and exhausting and put me in a place of being suicidal all the time. Or at least returning to that point again of thinking, there just is no hope. Nothing will ever become better. Nothing will ever improve. It's only just going to slowly deteriorate and get worse. Or maybe something will happen that will make it rapidly get worse. Every day was a struggle to fend off the deterioration of life and the decay. And so on the very day that I had my encounter with what I call to be God, earlier that day I was talking to the guy with whom I had been talking. And he asked me about something that was in the Bible, and he said, doesn't that sound good? And I said, yeah, it sounds great, but it's all bullshit. And I threw the Bible at him. I slammed it down on the table, throwing it. Later on that night, I had an experience where I felt this overwhelming love that I could only describe as God. And I looked at this man named Ron, and I saw Jesus on the cross. And I seized the opportunity to let him know just how pissed off I was at having ever been born. And how utterly angered I was that I wasn't able to help put him on that cross. A place that, in my mind, he very much deserves to be. The response that I got was to allow me to continue to vent my hostility and anger. And to summarize, basically to say, when you're finished with that, I love you and want to take you into my arms. Which just provoked another round of hostility. But ultimately, Love wins. This led to a continuing struggle where now I had to face whether this religion I had spent my life rejecting, what about it was right? What about it was correct? What about it was accurate? And what about it was not? And so I was able to challenge and test plenty of ideas as well as not necessarily accepting principles in the first place. Because this is a belief system at least in terms of 
most of the mainstream traditional ideas that had actually turned me to atheism. They had actually converted me to atheism and persuaded me that whatever there is, it's not what these specific denominations are worshiping. At least not the image that they're presenting. And my experience, I like to describe it as the God that I never believed in. It was affirmed to me that that God was not real, but that something better was. So I grabbed a hold of this idea that now I had been reborn, that I had been made new, and I very much had an expectation that who I was was finally, finally going to stop being who I had always been. And that I eagerly awaited this new creation that was promised. This world without struggle, this world without challenges, this world without mistakes, this world without disagreement. This idea that we have of this utopia, this perfect paradise, this thing where there is never any uphill struggle, never any falling down, never any rough places, never any challenges, never any shortcomings. And I started having some very ferocious arguments. And the best summary that I can give of these is to say that the response I got was something along the lines of, who told you that there was something wrong with you? Who told you this isn't what I created? Who told you that this isn't perfect? You know, who told you this isn't the new creation? And I can say something like, yeah, but I mean, are you going to tell me that this is it? This is this you're saying this is this is it? So the response is something along the lines of so who's the one that has a problem with who you are? And who's the one that has a problem with what this world looks like? And the answer is that I am. I do. I'm the one with the problem. And the response is something like, that's right. You're the one with the problem. You're the one with the wrong perspective. Who told you this isn't what I created? Who told you that I was displeased with this? Who told you that I thought you were defective? I did. That's who. Me. Not God. I'm the one with the problem. I'm the one that's dissatisfied with what was made. Not the one who made it. So yes, I very much understand having this objection to this being the new creation and saying, are you kidding me? And I had quite this struggle. Until one day I finally caved and I said, I don't agree with it. But I understand that I'm the one who doesn't agree with it. And that was the first step. To say, I'm the one with the problem that this is it. I'm the one with the problem that I am who I am. And that's probably the biggest objection that there would be 
to saying that this is the new creation. And I can see how if that's the perspective, it's not going to be a joyful announcement to say, hey, life is shit and that's all there is. Get used to it. That doesn't sound like a joyful announcement. So there really does have to be a mind change, a perspective change, a putting on of the mind of Christ, a seeing with the eyes of God and thinking with the thoughts of God, a having a pure heart to see God in those whom you previously did not see God when you had that wrong perspective. I can understand, but as I started to realize that the problem was mine and the perspective that was wrong was mine, and I started to say, what if this really is the new creation? What if I am really what I was made to be? it really does start to transform and alter and to change your perspective. And you do start to look at other people and say, that person is who he was made to be. And she's exactly what God wanted her to be. And this world is exactly what God made it to be. And that doesn't mean that everything that we've done and how we've used it or how we've treated it is what God intended it to be. But he doesn't plan to burn the fuck out of it and restore and and replace it with something different. That's a lie. That's a fabrication. It's a fiction. So another problem that people will have with the idea of a new creation is that in our culture we typically have this idea that creation is something called creation ex nihilo. Nihilo means nothing. It's the word that nihilism, the philosophy that I previously had, comes from. It's nothingness. Ex means out of. Creation ex nihilo is creation out of nothing. It's when there is nothing, and then there is creation. There is nothing, and boom! Big Bang explosion. The universe. There is nothing, and then God speaks, and there is something. Or even everything. But most creation stories and traditions are not based on the idea of there ever being a nothing and then something. Most are based on the idea of there being something which dies and then rises again as something new. Something that mirrors our seasonal change of spring birth and growth and blossoming and summer continuing to grow and fall harvest and winter death and winter solstice rebirth. Most creation tales follow this kind of parallel of a life that goes through cycles and dies and is reborn as something new and fresh and vibrant and alive. And so it's important to understand that the gospel stories are announcing a new creation. Not a new creation that's looming in the near or perhaps distant future in, in 2019. 
but a new creation that they told you in the gospel stories. A new creation that culminates as the corn of wheat is planted into the heart of the earth and resurrects in spring on Easter, sprouting up new life as a mustard seed that begins to grow and spread and take over. And by no means do I think that it is a wrong interpretation, or do I want to subtract from the idea that when in the book of John it says, in the beginning it was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and that all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made, that for you to bounce back to Genesis 1 and to say, there he is, there he is doing it. That's not a wrong interpretation. There's nothing to be taken away from that in what I'm saying here. But what I want to convey is that is the lesser of the meanings that's trying to be given to us. When we're being told that everything is made by Jesus, it's not all things are made by him. Now bounce back to Genesis 1 and see how he did it. It's all things are made by him. Now continue reading this book and I'll tell you about how that happened. Which means that the rest of the gospel story is a continuing tale of how that creation happened. And at the cross, the corn of wheat died and was buried in the ground. And at the resurrection, it sprouted up a new life, the beginning of a new creation. So these places where we're told about the foundations of the earth that were crafted by Jesus, or that the opening of Book of Hebrews saying that everything is upheld by his word, the beginning of the Book of John, the prologue, which means the introduction, which means the part that comes before anything else, which means there is no bouncing back into the past to continue the story but only of reaching into the future to continue the story. Where we're told that Jesus is the founder of all creation, it's not denying that Jesus was the founder of all Genesis 1 creation. But it's saying that the book of John is, new cre is a creation story. The book of Matthew is a creation story. The book of Luke is a creation story. The book of Mark and the book of Revelation are creation stories. The epistles are telling you that we're in a new creation. They're telling you that the problem you have with the world you live in and the person that you are is your problem, not God's. So in the beginning was the Word, and everything was made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So let's continue to read the book of John and find out how that happened. Not bounce back to Genesis 1 to find out how that happened. Continue reading the Gospel story to find out how that happened. That's really what the New Testament writers were trying to convey. They were trying to say, we're in a new creation. And in doing so, there were people born prior to that creation. People born into a Genesis 1 creation. People born into an Adam and Eve creation. People born prior to the resurrection. and the rising of new life. And so this illustration would be like if I were to tell my mother, who was born in 1937, come into the internet age. She's living during the internet age. It's here. It's now. It exists. But what I'm saying is stop handwriting paper checks and sending them via postal service 
to pay your bills. And then my dad, born in 1936. I have no need to tell him to come into the internet age. Because as technology developed, he said, this is cool. Let me find out how this works. And he said, wow, you know what? I can set up my bills to pay themselves. Set it and forget it. Awesome. So while being born at essentially the same time, he's living in the internet age and she is not. And I'm just using this as an illustration. I'm not saying that's actually a contrast between my parents. But I might need to give an illustration to somebody born prior to an age, prior to the new creation. Hey, you're in a new creation. The one that you were born into isn't here anymore. It's been replaced. There's something else here now. You think that you're under this law of Moses, and you're not. You're in a new kingdom, and there is no law of Moses there. That thing died at the cross, and what rose again was certainly not the law of Moses. And I might need to give you illustrations to say, this change that happened right before you, that you didn't really pay any attention to, is more important than you realize. And you need to let go of this world that you were living in. You need to let go of the paradigm that you were raised under and replace it with this new thing. You need to throw it out. You need to get rid of this concept that you were born under Adam and Eve Adam and realize that he died at that cross and the one that rose is the last Adam the new creation the new man so I might need to give you an illustration that tells you that you were part of this rebirth but I really shouldn't need to tell people 2,000 years later that they're not part of something that died 2,000 years ago and that they are part of something that was born 2,000 years ago. And yet here we are, and that's exactly what needs to be done. Zero people in 2019 who are alive right now were ever born under Genesis 1 creation or under Adam. They have all been reborn under last Adam and new creation. John 1 creation. Or if you prefer, resurrection creation. And so there might be different illustrations. And one of the problems is that religion has systematized these and taken one illustration and said, that's who God is. And taken another illustration and said, that's who God is. And taken another illustration and said, that's what happened at the cross. But the illustration was simply an illustration. And it had limitations of being an illustration. And while they might harmonize with one another, to turn it into a system of theology is where things go wrong. Because what happens if you systematize things, you end up married to your brother and somehow married to your father. That's a little weird. Because the illustration of father is one that might or might not resonate with you. Maybe you had a terrible father. Maybe when Jesus says, Whose father, who has a father that when you ask him an egg will give you a stone? Maybe you're right here, me. I'm the one who, that's exactly the kind of thing my dad would do. Maybe you were abused by your father. Maybe the illustration of father just falls flat to you because it doesn't work. But to many, it is going to work. They're going to go, 
I understand that. Or as a father or mother myself, I understand the kind of love that I have for, towards my children. But maybe that illustration doesn't work. Maybe you need something else. Maybe you need to have a spouse. Maybe the understanding of that oneness you feel for a person that you didn't know for a part of your life and then now you can't imagine life without them. Maybe that's the illustration you need. Maybe that doesn't work for you. Maybe you've never really found true love. Maybe you need an illustration of a brother. Maybe even as bad as your parents were, you had a sibling that was your rock and was always there for you and always reliable and always supportive. Maybe that's the illustration you needed. Or maybe you didn't have anybody in your entire family that ever did anything good for you. And your illustration needs to be a friend. A friend who's closer than a brother. Because you never had a brother that was worth a damn. At least not in your perspective. And maybe it was an accurate perspective. And so these are a variety of illustrations to try and produce the concept of God that says God is a love that gives, wanting nothing in return. God will never leave you and forsake you. God will never separate from you. God is one with you, just like a spouse. God is who you're made from, just like a parent. God has the same DNA running through you, just like a brother. God chooses to be with you, just like a friend. But let's not make this into a systematic cosmic anatomy where you're married to your father. Let's let the illustration be an illustration. And that's where so much of religion goes wrong, is it doesn't let it simply be an illustration. It systematizes things. So when you have a passage in Hebrews that says the blood of bulls and goats could never take away your sins, but by one offering, Jesus has perfected forever them who he sanctified. It doesn't mean that the problem was, oh, look, you fools, you were sacrificing pigs, or not pigs, but goats and bulls, and you should have been sacrificing a virginal human. Look, that's why God didn't accept it. That's why it didn't take away your sins was because it wasn't a human sacrifice. That's a step backwards. The illustration was to say, get rid of making sacrifices. Stop making sacrifices. Stop doing it. God doesn't want sacrifice. And if so, we can tell you that this offering perfected you forever. Go with it. But don't systematize it into that's what God demanded and that's what caused God to change his mind about his perspective of you. And if the illustration says you died with Christ and dead people aren't under a law, then go with it. If that's what can set you free from the law, go with it. But it doesn't mean that you in 2019 need to die in order to be dead to the law, because guess what? You weren't born in that kingdom. If there's a law in China that says I can only have one child and I have 19 and they give me a television show and I live in the United States and I was born in the United States and I'm a citizen of the United States, guess what I'm not under? I'm not under a law of China that says I can only have one child. You don't live in that kingdom. You don't even live in that creation. You were not born under Adam. That's a lie. That's a fiction invented by medieval people that hated themselves. Most notoriously, Augustine, who couldn't stand himself. 
He had an absolute self-hatred, and he made that what God was. No, that's not what God was. That was what, that's what Augustine of Hippo was. Augustine of Hippo is not God. And his poor image of himself does not reflect the God that he didn't know. Because if he knew that God, he would have had a discussion that said, why don't you fix me? And that God would have said, what is there to fix? Who's the one that has the problem with who you are? So there's a variety of illustrations. And whichever one it is that works for you is what can work for you. But those illustrations were for people that were born before the new creation occurred and were living after the new creation had happened. So I just clicked on the wrong thing there. So we see in Romans 5.17, it says, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Religion gets caught up on the all men being under condemnation, but doesn't believe that the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Because what is this doing? This is telling you that old Adam is dead and last Adam is risen. It's telling you Genesis 1 creation died and resurrection creation has been born. So then we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. All of creation died. And that he died for all, that they which lived should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we that no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you, in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness, righteousness of God in him. So, this is characterized as though it says, just so long as you have grabbed on to being in Christ, then you're a new creature, and then old things are passed away. But really it's saying, anyone who understands that he's in Christ, understands his new creation. Why? Because now the statement comes, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That is not what happens by getting yourself into Christ. It's what happens by seeing it, by having the perspective change. Colossians 3, 9. Lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds... Who is this addressed to? This is addressed to people that were born under Genesis 1 creation and now living under resurrection creation. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, 
where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. It's clear that it's saying that everything is part of this new creation. Religion hates that. I hate that. That's exactly the argument that I have with the one who made me. Don't tell me this is what you made and this is what you want it to be. I have a problem with that. Colossians 1.12 giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. By him all things consist. Everything is made of him. There's nowhere that he isn't. There's no outside. And not that it's wrong to think that all things were created by him and for him, so let's bounce back to Genesis 1. But really, all things were created by him and for him, so let's look at the gospel story. Because that's the creation story. And that's really what he's trying to tell you in this passage. He's not trying to tell you bounce backwards in time to this previous creation that you're not part of because that Adam died. He even said that Adam died. Another one rose. He's saying let go of this old creation. He's saying stop bouncing back to Genesis 1 creation and go to the cross and look at the resurrection because that's the new creation. I know, you've got a problem with that. It sucks. You don't like it. You don't think that can possibly be it. That can't possibly be the world that God really intended. You can't possibly be the person that God really wanted you to be. I've had that argument. I understand it. But are you going to believe your own opinion? Or are you going to put on the mind of Christ and see a God who made the world that said, very good. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And he's saying that not just about Jesus, but about you. Because I had this consultation with someone talking about how I did not have... Well, it goes back that he had a message that said about being encouraging towards others, being kind towards others, you, thinking about the kinds of words that you say towards other people. And I thought about it for a week, and I came back to him, and I said, I thought I was so on board with that message until I tried to say anything like that about myself. I can't say those kind things about myself. 
I can't say those encouraging things about myself. I can do it about you. I can do it about someone else. But then when I try and direct it towards myself. And he said to me, do you believe the word of God? And I had to spend some serious time and think about that. What is the word of God? Is the word of God that God said to stone a man to death for picking up firewood on Saturday? What is the word of God? And I had to think about that for a long time. And the conclusion that I came to was that the word of God is, this is my uniquely beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And that that applies to me. And that that applies to you. And that that is unwavering and immovable and immutable and unchanging and eternal and that nothing can ever subtract from that and so do I believe the word of God that I am the uniquely beloved son in whom he is well pleased no I don't because I'm not well pleased but do I believe God is well pleased I think I do So what is the word of God? The word of God is this is my uniquely beloved son in whom I'm well pleased and everything else has to fall in line with that. Everything else has to fall in line with this is my unique, precious, peculiar treasure that is worth giving everything to have. Oh, I'm talking about you. Yes, that can be hard to swallow. So do I believe the word of God? I'm getting there. I think I believe it. I would say I'm not fully persuaded. I understand the challenge. I understand the objection. But I understand that the objection is mine, not God's. Revelation 4, verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things, and for your pleasure they are and were created. And I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and will, he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there. And they shall need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God give them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. 